Welcome to the sixth session of our Virtual Production 201 series. In this session, we will cover what you need to know in using various types of camera tracking systems for virtual production. I am Susie Zwarman, a VFX and virtual production producer and member of the Synthi Rapid Industry Solutions, RIS, for on-set virtual production. The goal of today's panel is to give anyone interested in setting up their first virtual production a good idea of what types of camera tracking systems they will need on set. So let's begin today's panel of experts. First up, we have Mike Reed, currently the CCO at Bendec, with over 30 years of experience in broadcast, film, visual effects, and virtual technologies. He's been involved in virtual production covering 3D tracking and real-time compositing while working as the commercial director for Mosis. Next, we have Chris Probst, an ASC cinematographer, working in a range of filmmaking arenas, from commercials and music videos to narrative projects for both movies and television, and has been involved with various aspects of virtual production. So let's begin with our list of questions for today. What is camera tracking? And why do you need it for virtual production? Mike, can I start with you? Absolutely, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, so virtual production is combining same size computer graphic imagery with the output of a camera and blending the two together so they look like one complete visual effect shot. Um, if we look at the image, you can see that I have a camera and I have an Unreal Engine interface where you can see a little camera looking at the 3D object. That's the virtual camera. And the piece in the middle is the tracking is basically sticking the virtual camera to the real camera. So they are synchronized in movement in 3D space and actually with the lens as well for focus and zoom. In general, camera tracking uh, in a virtual production environment involves knowing where the physical recording camera in the virtual space, otherwise known as a volume when you're looking at the, the footprint of the actual stage, where that camera is in perspective to the panels. Because when you're mapping a virtual environment on the LED wall environment, um, it needs to know where the camera's perspective is looking at those environments to then do real-time calculations of what that perspective would look like into the actual um, virtual assets. And that helps you enable, um, when you do a camera movement, it senses where that camera's perspective is shifting and it's able to do real-time calculations and create parallax within environments uh, that are extending virtually in depth. So often people ask, what is the data set? What is the tracking data set? So here you've got a little animation, which is showing you the six axes of movement. So it's pan, tilt, roll, and then X, Y, Z, or truck, dolly, elevation. And these are the tracking elements for the movement of the camera. In addition to that, we have typically two, you can have three. But typically two, which is the focus and the zoom data. There's an encoder on the lens and it captures the focus and zoom combined with a map of that lens. And the reason we have the lens mapped is because the output from the Unreal Engine is CGI. It's perfect, but lenses aren't perfect. They're very linear in the middle and they distort at the edges. So if you want to get a perfect match of your Unreal scene, you want to distort the scene the same way as the lens that you're using. And that's why we have the encoded focus and zoom. Additionally, on the focus, you can do um, virtual focus pulling within the actual environment. So um, you can actually have, because the, the focus is encoded at a certain point, if you wanted to actually rack and then have the, the focus pull virtually continue, uh, you can do that. Um, that becomes more applicable if you start playing with uh, depth of field on the actual virtual environments so that you're actually forcing uh, focus fall off as it gets further away from camera, for example. Um, and then you can wind up playing with that as well. So by having something encoded, you can hook up a physical focus pull to a virtual focus pull, for example. We call the, the virtual production stages of volume as a carryover from motion capture stages. So when you have a, a, a surrounding s a system of cameras looking at an interior space, that volume that is actually uh, the coverage area of what all those cameras are looking at, that's the volume. So when you have a, a, a outside in camera tracking system, for example, you're looking at a set of markers or a, um, a puck that has uh, IR emitters on that, right? So we need to know where that camera is in that physical space that's contained within your LED stage 
So when you move the camera, it's doing real-time calculations and creating those perspective shifts on the actual LED environment that is being imaged on your wall, right? So that if you were in a forest and you're dialing on the stage and you have some actual fake tree stumps on your stage, there's virtual trees in the background and they're all having that parallax happening between all those objects on stage. That's why you need to track the camera so that it looks real to your eye. Because if it was um, a painted backdrop, for example, those trees would be static. And if you had foreground trees, you'd have parallax, but then the background would look artificial because the trees aren't shifting, right? This goes back to the techniques of like multi-plane animation. They would create different layers of cell, uh, of gel, uh, of animation gel so that they can get parallax happening so that the animation felt more lifelike. And that's the extension of that idea is we need to see that real-time parallax. And all that is happening uh, with a 3D environment in the gaming engine that's driving those graphics and being created in real time uh, and, and showing where your perspective of your virtual cam camera is mapped to where your physical camera is. So your perspective is appropriate. Why would you choose inside out tracking over outside in tracking? And in what scenarios would you use each one for tracking? Mike, I'd like to start with you. There are two kinds of tracking system that people should be aware of. One is a inside out system, which is marker based. So it's a a collection, a star map, if you like, of retroflector stickers that can be on the ceiling, they can be on the floor, they can actually even be digital on the LED wall pulsed out of um, sync of the, the camera shutter. That's an inside out because essentially the sensor is looking out of the performance area, the volume, at the star map. Very good for tracking single cameras. And the other type, which is on the left-hand side here of the image, is uh, outside in. And essentially what that is is a ring of cameras that are all looking at a, a puck on a, on a camera, or they're looking at a suit with uh, mocap actors, uh, which are wearing. And it's basically calculating the position in 3D space of multiple objects. So wherever you have to track multiple objects, it makes a lot of sense to use an outside inside. Inside out tracking is a less expensive way to track uh, a single object like a camera. Um, outside in tracking is, is a more expensive option, but it's basically better for tracking multiple objects or actors. So the scenarios you'd use them in is if you're just doing virtual production with a single camera, that's the only thing you have to track, and you're in a studio, then you'd use an inside-out tracking system. If you've got to capture uh, an actor, performer, you've got to have objects tracked, maybe you want to do motion capture as well, then outside-in is a better system. I would add to that, um, but there are uh, reasons to select either one of them. Um, if you're using a single camera, you can use outside in and still track just a single camera. You don't have to have multiple objects be tracked. But also, um, cost-wise, uh, if you have a ring of 40 uh, sensors, cameras that are looking at your volume space, uh, that's a certain dollar figure if they're building a, a volume stage versus one sensor on the camera looking at a bunch of IR stickers and the uh, actual sensor on the camera is emitting IR light. Um, as a cinematographer... One impact is that um, if I'm looking up and I have a lot of low angles on the LED stage and I'm trying to photograph the transition of the ceiling and uh, the wall, and I've got a ring of cameras in shot that now need to be painted out, that adds post-production costs. So using an inside-out system, I can actually not even see the IR reflectors and um, photograph in camera. You know, for me, the idea of in-camera visual effects is trying to get final pixel as much as possible. So... I may select an inside-out system if I know I'm going to be looking up at that transition or if I'm going to look up at the ceiling and I don't want to photograph the actual uh, ring of cameras. That's a great answer. Thanks, Chris. Our next question. In what scenarios would you use inside-out and outside-in tracking systems together? And can you please explain this hybrid approach? So I just, I said, like, if you were having to paint out, uh, you know, cameras, for example, that's additional post-production cost. And you've already flipped the paradigm by having to create all the visual effects, these environments, the visual effects that you would capture in camera prior to production so they can be imaged on your LED wall. Um, so, but maybe I'm in a scenario now where I also want to track an object. Like, for example, if a character is holding a flashlight, they're going through a, a cave or a tunnel, or I did a, um, a film for Sony where we, we had a character going through an Egyptian tomb and she's carrying a flashlight, right? So in that scenario, we actually put IR reflectors on the actual physical flashlight she was holding so that when she turned the flashlight toward the actual LED panels, it was coupled with a virtual flashlight. 
that casted a virtual beam into the virtual environment so that she was lighting the environment she was pointing at in the virtual space. And that became a very believable effect. And when she turned the camera, the flashlight's on, and she would flick it off and point it at the wall and then have a virtual beam. And um, that marrying of approach was um, really important. And that could only be achieved by the, an outside-in system looking at those reflectors on the actual physical flashlight. So if I only had inside out, uh, I wouldn't be able to do that shot. Um, for me though, uh, if I still want to be able to do those low angles and not have to paint out cameras, and I, I may have a inside out ca uh, sensor on the camera, but then I could also place additional cameras looking in to track other objects. And this can become important if you start to get into applications like using AR and actually coupling um, augmented reality on like a live broadcast feed, right? So you're tracking camera, you're having virtual production in camera for broadcast, but now you want to add in an augmented reality layer on top of that video output. So then you would need to have outside in looking at that as well. Our next question is, um, what is markerless tracking versus marker-based tracking? And where would you use each? For example, uh, Mike, would you say it's good for use outside the studio? Because it gives you complete movement of the camera. Are there other situations where you would use either either one? Can you explain? Yeah, there are. So, so with a marker-based system, you've got a star map or a sticker map. Um, where you're putting retroflective stickers on the floor or the ceiling, um, and that works fine. Um, the way the markerless system works is it's got a separate camera that's taking a view of the scene in front, and it's calculating... Uh, three-dimensional positions of highlight points. It's creating a virtual star map from the image in, in front of the camera. One system uses two little eyes that sit on top. Uh, there's a new system called Through the Lens, but essentially it's creating a virtual star map and therefore it can track um, objects relative to that star map. Where would you use markerless? Generally outside. Uh, it's very, very good where you can't put stickers on the ground or the ceiling. You can't use encoder-based systems. It's very, very good for that. Like, would you say for like live concert events outside or sports yeah. events, would that be an example? Yeah, absolutely. So things like uh, NFL Super Bowl will use this technique um, Great. for for putting graphics. It's looking and creating 3D maps of, of objects and able to map where those are, right? And it has a, its own algorithm software that works in conjunction with, basically there's two cameras that are attached, mini cameras that are looking offset to each other at objects and they can sense perspective shifts and, and calculate where objects are based on that. So if you're, you're having to map something or track something um, that isn't in a controlled environment, like a virtual production stage where it's already rigidly uh, established where tracking cameras are and where markers are, uh, that's a good solution. Where does encoder-based tracking make sense over marker-based tracking? And can you also explain what encoded base capture, you know, when it's used, how it's used and when it's used? So in a scenario um, outside where you've got a camera position, let's say it's got a zoom lens on, and you can't put a star map on the ground, you certainly can't put one on the ceiling because you're outside, um, but you still need to track the pan and tilt of the camera and the zoom. So that's a very good example where you would use uh, encoded head, gives you the pan and the zoom, and then you'd put encoders on the, the focus of the zoom. And a good example would be um, Thanksgiving Day Parade 2021. Uh, there were multiple cameras shooting virtual AR objects coming down the street, and that's the only way that could get done. So that's how we use it. What camera tracking solutions are available to provide a track shot that starts outside of an enclosed space and then travels into the enclosed space as one continuous shot? I've done on stage where we were shooting on a virtual production volume and we were actually outside of a car and then we actually dollied inside of the car. So in that scenario, imagine if you had outside in tracking systems looking at either like a Sputnik on the camera or a, or a puck that's emitting IR lights that suddenly when it goes inside the interior of the car, all those those point sources that the cameras are looking for are occluded. They're blocked. You can't see it. So then the, the actual tracked object goes invisible to the uh, tracking system. Built inside of the, the, the actual um, tracking system, though, is what's called IMU. IMU stands for Inertial Measurement Unit. It's what's in everybody's uh, mobile phone, and it allows you to you know, move your phone around, get directions about where you're going and what you're looking at. Essentially, it's a little chip that contains uh, magnetometers, accelerometers, 
and gyroscopes, and it can measure um, angular movement and acceleration from a fixed point. Yeah, so like when you're moving that camera in the car, even though it loses the tracking points, it still feels the motion of the camera, right? So then it's continuing that as a um, band-aid for the loss of data and continues that motion, right? So those gyros are feeling the motion of the camera if it, it's moving around and tilting, and you're still getting tracking data sent to the system, so you just don't suddenly lose all, where your virtual camera is in the space. We have a clip of, uh, of some of that scenario with going into the interior of a car, which is, you know, it, both systems will inside and uh, inside out and outside in lose their references. Because in fact, even outside in is still a marker-based system is looking for markers on the camera, whether it be a, uh, a puck emitting light or IR reflectors that are mounted to the camera. Either way is a marker base. So IMU is, a, is, a, is sort of a third way of getting sort of any sort of data that still is giving a reference of what's happening with the camera in physical space. Great. Are camera lenses and low-cap actors the only items that require tracking in virtual production? Um, no, actually, with all of these different technologies, uh, there are so many different applications now. So if you wanted to have a situation where you're doing live broadcast, for example, and you wanted to track something, um, that needs to be added on with an AR element, for example. So you have a, a, a broadcast and you want to have an, a person carrying an object that then gets replaced by an AR feature. So maybe it's a it's a Pokemon, right? And it's a cartoon character that's going to get superimposed, but they're carrying just a little uh, a stuffed animal doll that has some tracker markers on it. In those situations, you still need to be able to track something and, and add to that later. I think we're moving to a point now where we need to track other elements in the set. So, for example, set pieces or, or even lights, um, because they're all going to move around, and we need to be able to go back to a previous version. So I think being able to track more than, than the, the cameras, the lenses, and the people, or the talent is is going to happen. And we need a database for that, which is, you know, Perforce is perfect. Okay, next question. What type of camera systems are best to use on an LED volume stage? Can we talk about some of the technical problems, Chris, between digital and film cameras that you mentioned earlier in testing? The loaded short answer is all of them are applicable, um, especially now where all of the varieties of digital camera solutions out there have gotten quite good, okay? Um, and it's not to say that you can't take a film camera into a volume space. There is no, um, there's no prohibiting factor that you can't film on celluloid in a volume space. Um, digital represents uh, certain aspects on the technical side that have to be achieved, like uh, Genlock and, and sync issues to make sure that your scan rates are, are lining up with the scan rates of the actual um, LED volume and there's pros and cons of the hardware uh, choices from the pixel pitch of the panels and the sensor pitch of the camera to avoid more issues, um, as well as uh, how the actual uh, shutter works on the actual digital camera. And uh, Mike, I think you had some ideas about uh, global versus rolling shutter, for example. Yeah, that's right. So, so in the same way to avoid the gelling effect, if you're shooting a helicopter blade spinning around, a global shutter is, is, is better, but there are very few global cameras. Um, the reality is you can use rolling shutter, it's fine, as long as you make sure that it's gen locked with the wall and the wall is being flashed at a high enough frequency, then there really are no issues at all. So it, really any camera you can use. Can you explain that latency exists and what it is? So I'll, I'll give you a, a technical um, overview. So basically when you're shooting uh, against an LED volume, the moment in time that you capture a frame of your image in your camera and the tracking data that relates to that frame, the delay is the time it takes that data set to get into the Unreal Engine, for the Unreal Engine to create the correct viewpoint, create the image for that, and then output it through the LED processor and put it on the wall and then for it to be shot by the camera. That's called overall delay. And typically, uh, it's about four or five frames. When you add on set extensions, which is probably more typical in broadcast, um, you add an extra delay as well to put those, you know, that extra key layer on top. And it can get quite high with, you know, between nine and 12 frames is quite, um, is quite common. On the left-hand side, you're seeing a scenario where the delay is quite extreme and it can't complete the right-hand edge of the frame to keep up with the camera movement. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can. That's, that's delay being sort of shown in, in the real world. That's actually how it manifests itself. I think, Chris, you were talking about the, um, the frustrum as well. 
Yeah, well, we're asking a lot of the technology, right? We have multiple systems that all have to work in unison together. We have the real-time uh, content creation by a video game engine creating this environment and, and, and displaying it onto LED panels that are displaying that at a high enough frame rate. And then we have a camera capturing that it has to be genlocked and synced to that environment. And then you have tracking systems that are looking at that. The trick is that they all have to work in concert with each other. So when you're moving the camera, let's say if we're talking about an outside-in system, right? So we have a bunch of cameras looking at this physical camera moving into space. That, then, that data, that XYZ's data that's calculated from all these cameras looking from different perspectives and seeing these tracker markers on the camera move has to then be fed to the video game engine. The video game engine then has to say, okay, here's where I'm going to place the virtual representation of that camera and its view that is moving, right? And that has to then process the environment that's being created on the fly and put that up on the panels. All that sort of time is your latency. And like you said, is anywhere from four to even seven frames, depending on how taxing your environment is also to create the real-time tracing of uh, of light rays that are happening, parallax of like, like that forest scenario I was talking about with the trees moving, all that has to happen. So that's your latency. And so what do you do? You have your, um, this square that you saw that was on the, the, the edge of your frame is called your frustum. And the frustum is the virtual viewport of what the virtual lens is, is seeing based on your physical lens you have in your ticking camera. So you will tell the Unreal operator, I'm wearing a 50 millimeter lens right now. They will type in 50 and it will calculate the field of view uh, that you would see for the 50 millimeter lens and bring up that viewport. Inside that frustum viewport is the highest resolution calculation of the real-time creation of your assets with the parallax happening. You can tell outside the frustum, just make it a static image and even it can be lower resolution because it's only for uh, incidental lighting so that your best representation of your scene with all the parallax and corrections happening inside the frustum. Now, if you're doing a fast whip pan, that latency can mean that the pan happens a few frames behind and you can actually wind up photographing that edge of that panning um, frustum view. One solution to fix that is to physically make that frustum larger. So then you give it a multiplication factor. You make it one and a half times larger so that when I'm panning, I'm still within, I'm not shooting across the edge of that. And that could be a solution, but it means that that real-time calculation, that view, that high resolution generation of, of the graphics and the parallax has to be much larger. So that means you have to have um, a faster capability on your system processing, for example. So that may not be uh, capable on some systems or it may degrade the image to be able to do the processing in real time fast enough. Um, that's something to consider when you're when you're doing a fast whip pan, or you may have to alter it. I've actually done scenarios where we solved that by shooting with a motion control rig and had zero latency. But we did that because we could tell the motion control you're programming a move, and that is actually just an X, Y, and Z data set that you're telling the motion control rig. So you already have X, Y, Z data as part of this move is going to take the camera and move it to here. Those are coordinates, right? That's the same thing that the camera tracking system is trying to create for you to feed Unreal Engine is XYZ coordinates for where the camera is going to be. So the MoCo rig is is, is already self-tracked. But because it's uh, on a trigger, we can actually tell the motion control rig to send those coordinates ahead of time before it actually moves the camera. So we've actually triggered uh, a MoCo shot with a fast uh, bolt system that was doing these whip pans. But it was sending the data seven frames in advance to Unreal, that all the processing time it took to take that data and then spit it out to the panels happened seven frames later. But when it happened is exactly when the motion control camera started to move now. So then the frustum was deadlocked with that whip pan. And now that, that's one way to achieve zero latency. But you can't use a MoCo rig for every single shot um, and sort of want to make your, your, your shooting day. So it's, um, it's a Band-Aid. It's not a complete solution. Where do presumed tracking solutions make sense? Where do professional tracking solutions make sense? One of the biggest problems of virtual production is a lack of trained talent, right? It's just, it is. It's, uh, it, and it's been that way since Mandalorian uh, came out. So the prosumer systems allow people to get on board and train in their own environment at their own pace and to learn all the skills. And in some cases, the content they create, that's a good enough solution for them. When you get to mission critical uh, content creation, so there's no chance to repeat, you can't do multiple takes, you have to go to a, a professional system. And, and where there's no possibility that you can have the graphics slip, whether it's on camera movement or the lens change, you've got to use a professional system. So um, that, that's 
the way I look at this. Chris, what do you think? The exciting thing about virtual production is that it is an evolution and extension of techniques that have been around since the dawn of cinema. So if you look back at, you know, Jimmy Stewart driving in a car and you have rear screen projection behind him or um, outside the windows of a, of a set build, you had photograph uh, painted painted backdrops that then evolved into trans lights, actual photographed on translucent material that could get uh, an environment outside the window um, or even blue screen and green screen travel mat techniques. Of, you have them on blue and then you put them into environment. All those techniques, uh, uh, virtual production is now a, a direct evolution of. So that rear screen projection is now an LED panel. Those painted backdrops or trans lights can be a motion backdrop with video content. And instead of being a painted or a photographed static image, now it can be a live image they can have um, if you're in the an apartment in you know downtown Manhattan and you have traffic outside the window and from your and a plane flying by the window or whatever you want in terms of real time uh, images. So all of those uh, uh, techniques are super exciting, and we can leverage those and utilize um, all these different hardware options that are um, scalable, right? So I've done shots where I've taken a seventy inch, you know television set led or lcd monitor and put that outside of a car window right and done car process and that's perfectly viable so now if you were um if you want to make a short film and you're a, a student and you want to make a sci-fi uh thing and you're inside the space shuttle and you want to create something you could take a television set and put that outside of a the port of the of the space shuttle right and see the cosmos outside the window, right? And that's exactly what virtual production is doing. And then if you wanted to actually have tracking happening and see the wing of the space shuttle outside that window, you could actually get even prosumer level tracking systems like a Vive puck. And that still gives you X, Y, and Z data that can talk to Unreal. And Unreal is free to download from the internet. And so you can experiment and learn these techniques. So for me, it's, I don't see any world where virtual production, um, uh, it takes over every aspect of production, but it also isn't going away because it's a direct evolution of all these techniques that we've been using for 100 plus years in cinema. So that's super exciting and um, really puts, um, it democratizes the technology to every level. Do you have any real life stories from on set or any problems with tracking you have experienced? Yeah, obviously I'm not a cinematographer, but I'll, I'll give you some feedback from some of our teams that were on set. So there was a feature being shot in um it's a place called Alvernia Studios in Krakow in Poland. It's a fantastic place, but it's all domes. And uh they were using a marker based tracking system. And that's used normally to being uh deployed on flat services. And of course you've got a dome environment. How do you cope with that? So there was some special workarounds that they came across, but that was that was an interesting uh problem to solve. Yeah. You have to think about when you're when you're doing your shot listing and and sort of previsioning of, of what you want to do in a uh, virtual production space um, and make sure you're you're covered on all scenarios. I did a shot where we had the camera pointing straight up and we were using a uh, inside out tracking system. So there's an actual sensor that's looking up at what we call a constellation, a bunch of uh, uh, IR reflectors that are taped up to the grid or to the panels or whatever. But when I turn the camera straight up, that sensor is looking at the wall behind the volume, right? So we had to make sure that we had trackers placed and in, in calibrated for the system. So if I'm pointing straight up, it's looking at markers there. So then I could do, I did a big tilt down, right? And so by knowing that ahead of time, um, we could prepare for that sort of shot. And so that could have been a, a problematic situation on the tracking, um, although with IMU and do that sort of that fast tilt down, it would still give you some inertial uh, data that can pick up. But sometimes that handoff between IMU and tracking can create a little pop in the frustum, right? So you, you just got to be careful. But um, I think, you know, with all of these sort of uh, aspects, preparation is vital, right? So it, being as prepared and in the, the paradigm flip of production where, you're creating the visual effects beforehand. There's no longer fixing it in post per se or doing the VFX and trying to figure it out later. You're doing the VFX up front so that you can put them onto the wall and 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 capture them in camera. It's in camera visual effects. And the benefit of that is that the actors are seeing the environment, they're reacting to the environment, they are enveloped in the environment. It's actually partially lighting them as well. And it's also 
inspiring the filmmakers, the director and the cinematographer placing a camera, and they're looking at the composite happening live. There's not some composite happening months down the road uh, at the 11th hour with a bleary-eyed CGI technician trying to do the comp uh, to deliver the umpteenth change of the visual effects. It's happening in camera, so now the cinematographer and director are actually composing the visual effect composite and making that decision, the qualitative, the aesthetic choices, right? And something that people don't really talk about when it's a visual effects scenario, if you're on a blue screen or green screen, every single additional shot is an additional composite, which is an additional light item budget expense to do the composite down the road. When you've generated the environment, all right, you've done the expense of creating this virtual environment up front, if I want to add a shot and I pan the camera over and I get another shot, the composite happens live. There's no additional expense to then be inspired and find moments, to find uh, new shots you're not having to add in or get the, the producer to sign off on another expense because you've added, you know, 14 more shots to your VFX budget. So we are nearly at the end of our webinar, and I would like to get some final thoughts from each one of you. What are the most important lessons you have learned from filming on an LED volume stage? Can you please summarize the one thing you would like to share with our audience? I think because virtual production essentially is a reordering of the production process. Now your visual effects, your testing of shots and so on happens before the shoot. Preparation is key. And I think anybody who arrives at a volume that hasn't done the appropriate preparation is is going to have a challenge. So preparation is key. And the visual art department, the VAD, is is a crucial part of that. Yeah, I would even add to that. You know, the, the, the preparation for me as a cinematographer is about being informed, Right. So as the cinematographer, I'm in command of the photography and I need to know uh, both the aesthetic and the creative and the emotional aspects of the photography, but I also need to know the technical, right? And so walking into a new sort of technology, um, it's really the onus on the cinematographer to be as informed as possible, uh, especially there are levels of the capabilities and uh, know-how of these various uh, stages that are popping up from, you know, some abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town that buys some LED panels and is now a virtual production stage to, you know, ILM stagecraft, uh, you know, and everything in between. So you don't know what you're walking into per se. And so being as informed as possible about the various hardware choices that can impact the quality of the shoot. Are there sync issues? Are How do you test for sync issues? What are you looking for when you're walking into virtual production? That's not to say that I, I want to take over everybody's job. But I want to have an understanding of the technology that I'm um, that I'm marrying myself to in the photography that I could command it that I'm um, I'm informed of what are the the pitfalls that can um, happen to me. A, a great example of those pitfalls is even more a right when does that going to occur and understanding uh, the pixel pitch of the actual volume displays that the stage you're walking into is uh, can have a great impact on that. Uh, the camera choice can also affect those because there's a a relationship between the sensor pitch of the camera and the pixel pitch of the display. When those become in a line, you get this this vibrating banding artifact known as moray, which is a beat frequency of, of visual information. That um, that's something that you know is hard to predict. And the, the one safeguard you can have is be as high resolution on both sides of that as possible, but not be. That's not an infinite choice, right? Not every stage is going to have a, a one millimeter uh, display panel on there, and you know. But you can impact that by how you stage, where you put the actors from the panels, what camera choice you use, your lensing. Um, all that stuff means, by and large, being informed as you can and test, right? So if you don't know what you're uh, going to do, you can go and say, "Hey, uh, we'd like to come down and check out your LED stage." And this is our camera we're thinking about shooting on. I want to see how it reacts to your volume and make sure that we're getting good sync, good gen lock, that everything's talking to each other, that the tracking system is going to work well. Um, so testing, preparation are vital. I agree. I'm always budgeting testing for a, a certain amount of time with the DP. It's just crucial to setting up these shoots. And that is all we have time for today. First, I would like to thank Chris and Mike, our panelists, for sharing your experiences. And most important, I'd like to thank all of you who listened to this panel. You are the future of virtual production, and we can't wait to see what you create. Thank you all. Thank you.